this morning we can the uh, I will be talking actually about the precepts so talk about sila which we just took with the five precepts in the uh, Pali. We alternate between the Pali and the English, so which is good. So that people know what they're getting into, <laughs> what they're committing to. So it's very, very important. And the theme for this will be uh, today is looking at ethical behaviour as a gift to ourselves and others. And I call it the insurance policy. <laughs> People are always looking for the insurance policy, aren't they? But this insurance policy is much, much better than most because it goes beyond this life. <laughs> so this is uh, very useful. Most insurance, poli insurance policies are only for this life, aren't they? And uh, we don't get the benefit after this life. The people who are still we've left behind, uh, they will get the benefit. But this insurance policy the Buddha is talking about is of sila, of uh, ethical behaviour, we can we take with us because these are part of the qualities we develop in our uh, minds particularly and our consciousness when it moves on to another life it takes the good things and the bad things and i say to people when you go traveling do you uh, open your suitcase and empty the rubbish bin into it and then take it with you and think oh my god what did i bring this stuff for <laughs> so in the same way when we travel from this life to a next life we want to take something good in our suitcase, the things we need, the good qualities we've developed in this life, so that when we open the suitcase, we can say, ah, this is useful, this is good. And the, the new life will be a much uh, more pleasant life for us and for others as well. So this is the path of the Buddha, really, is to develop these good qualities by body, speech and mind. So, And this is what uh, I will be addressing uh, today. It's quite a, quite a big area, actually, but nevertheless. I'll start with a, a, a Pali verse that everybody knows, <laughs> I think, pretty much. Samma papa sa akaranang kusala sa upasampada sanchita pario da panang etang mudhana sa sanamti. There we are. So I think most people know that chant. It's the the Ovada Patimoka, they call it, and this is like the summary of the Buddha's teaching. But he said it's not only the summary of the Buddha's teaching, it's all the Buddha's, he says, because he says what it means is not to do any bad, to cultivate the good, kusalasa upasampada, and to purify one's mind. This is the teaching of, of the Buddha's. Oh. <laughs> That's all. Oh. I'd like a bit of a comment. There we are. So I was actually going to, we're talking about uh, ethical behaviour, but I was going to talk about it in the context of the Noble Eightfold Path because I've been, I have given a series of talks on it a couple of years ago and this visit I've covered, uh, so far I've covered three of the, uh, yes, three, three of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path and that's right view, right attitude and right speech. You might be thinking, did he? When did he do that? <laughs> but I did. I have done that so far, actually. And they're a bit different from the talks I gave two years ago, so it's good to have that change. And this one is the, uh, as I mentioned, the fourth one. Do people know what the fourth, the fourth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is? We've had right view, right attitude or right motivation, and... Uh, that we've had right speech, so... Mm. Got anyone? There we are, Kim. Very good, yes. Right action, that's it. Right action. So fourth, spoke of the wheel of Dhamma. Often we see the wheel of Dhamma with eight spokes for the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is the fourth one. The fifth, of course, is very important. I, I would like to give a talk about that later, and that's right livelihood. livelihood. How we make our living is very important. And as I, refl I mentioned to people, who do we spend most of our waking hours with? With the family? No, <laughs> at work, <laughs> at work. So it's a really important area to cover actually. And then of course after that right action and uh, from right action, right mindfulness and then from right mindfulness to right samadhi or right stillness as Ajahn Brahm calls it. So I'll just mention right action because I'm going to do more than just what right action covers because it's not the whole of uh, the ethical behaviour. 
And the, the Buddha says that right, uh, he defines right action as refraining from the destruction of life, refraining from taking what is not given, and refraining from sexual misconduct. And of course, we, uh, um, we see from the five precepts, of course, we've got refraining from lying and refraining from taking uh, alcohol and drugs that are the basis for carelessness. So that's the five precepts. But of course, right speech covered the speech aspect of our ethical conduct, and this is more the action side. And th there will be a few other things that I bring in as well with, um, uh, with uh, ethical behaviour. And it's uh, very important when we think of the Noble Eightfold Path uh, not to, to think of it in all its aspects because the more you look at the Noble Eightfold Path you realise how every aspect is really important, you know, really essential uh, for practising, you know, the spiritual life. And uh, the Buddha uh, never put anything extra in. He gave us what uh, was essential for us to attain liberation, to awaken, to liberate the mind. And to do that, he gave us this, this, these teachings. He said, actually, he once gave the simile, he said, he picked up a handful of leaves in the forest and he said, this is what I teach, but the leaves on the trees are what I know. <laughs> so that's it. That's, but he said, this is useful for, for a liberation. This is uh, the essential for, essential for teaching the path to liberation. So they all work together and it's uh, important to see that, especially with this um, uh, right, there are a number of factors that we need all the time and uh, we need to practice, not only for the, the Noble Eightfold Path, this spiritual path, but for our whole of our lives too, 24 seven. And really this Noble Eightfold Path is a 24 seven path. So the first thing is, it, what makes uh, right action right too is that we're coming from the right place. So that, for the for the, in the Buddhist context, is right view. We have an understanding that my actions, of body, speech, and mind, have consequences. They have results, and we call that karma. And I think uh, it's very, very e easy for people. Uh, you know, to see the results of karma in this life. Actually, sometimes people say, "Don't believe in karma." But I say, you know, you just do a test. You, you do something nice for somebody and see the result. Say something uh, nice to somebody and see the result. And the reverse. You can just see. This is what we call instant karma. You know, that things come back to us. And they're usually of a similar nature to what we put out. So it's the idea of what goes around, as I say in Australia, comes around. <laughs> it's, it's very obvious. But if we have that view, then, uh, of course, we... Uh, we are careful, we have the right uh, attitude, we tend to look at life in a, a different way. We want to come from a place which is kind. So we have with right attitude the, the idea of giving up or giving, this is nekama, the idea of developing positive states, particularly things like uh, loving kindness and uh, compassion, these things, and also non-harming, not hurting ourselves or others. And this is a consequence of seeing right action, or seeing right view, isn't it? Because you think, aha, there are consequences of how I uh, act or give rise to these positive or negative results. And the quality of, that it gives rise to will be similar to this motivation. So if I come from a good place, a positive <coughs> place, the results will be of a positive nature. But if I come from greed, from uh, hatred, from a delusion then, or, or hurting really, then the results will be of a similar nature. But in combination with that, we also need that right effort to, to uh, avoid and let go of the negative and, the posit and to develop and maintain the positive. So this works, doesn't it, all together, those, those three factors work together. So when you have those three factors, right speech, and right action tend to be supported or shaped by them. So we will uh, be coming from a place where we know, ah yes, there will be consequences of how I speak, how I act and how I think. 
and uh, that I want to come from a good place, so that's the right motivation or attitude, and, and I will, I'm working towards recognising these states and letting go of abandoning the negative states and developing the positive states, but more important, and most importantly, maintaining those positive states. So this is the uh, important aspect of the, how those factors work together in the Noble Eightfold Path. And just to, uh, to emphasise this too, to be a Buddhist, you know, often some people say, well, how do you become a Buddhist? And of course, how do you become a Buddhist? Any, any suggestions? Yes. You take the Buddha refuge, the Dhamma refuge, and that's, then that's it. That's it, Andrew. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes, exactly. Take the refuge. That's right. Three refuges. So that's acknowledging that the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha are important in your life. This potential to become enlightened, this uh, search for the truth, and also uh, seeing that some. Uh, People have developed this path already. But in order to become a practicing Buddhist, there are many, many Buddhists in the world, but not all of them are practicing, probably many, <laughs> most maybe not. But to become a practicing Buddhist at a minimum level is to do dana, dana is one of the aspects, and sila particularly, the ethical behavior. That's number, number one, really. And... Um, of course, if you have a, uh, you know, if you've taken refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha and there is that faith, that energy of confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, then you naturally want to, you know, to follow uh, ethical behaviour, develop ethical behaviour. And I remember many years ago when uh, Venerable Piyadasi, do people remember who Venerable Piyadasi was? He was a Sri Lankan monk, very famous one actually, yes. Yeah, that's, and he came to the monastery, Ajahn Brahm's monastery in Western Australia. And I asked, I asked him, you know, a question, because I had a question time, he gave a nice talk. And then um, I asked him a question, I said, what is the most, Bhante, what is the most important um, aspect of the Buddhist path? And I thought he would say something like, you know, uh, the uh, insight knowledges or, uh, you know, meditation, something like that. But he said, ethical behaviour. <laughs> because really, without ethical behaviour, we haven't really started the path. We haven't got a foundation for our practice uh, of the path. So this is, this is why he said it is so important uh, to, you know, uh, uh, as number one consideration. And the uh, subject that I mentioned, the title I mentioned for the talk to, so this morning, not this so afternoon, is a gift to ourselves and others. And I'd just like to have a quote from the Buddha where he mentions that. And he says, by abstaining from the destruction of life, all the other precepts too, the noble disciple gives to an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. He himself or she himself, she herself, <laughs> in turn enjoys immeasurable freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. This is the first gift, a great gift. And then he goes through all the five precepts. So this is a gift we give to others. So it's a, it's a really important gift. Because people often say, well, you know, they want to have a peaceful world. And how can they do that? This is the beginning. This is the beginning. Very important. You know, uh, people can write lovely uh, manifestos about peace, but if they actually take action there are, and, and look after their own bo uh, actions by body, speech and mind, this is the beginning of the contribution to peace in the family. Peace with ourselves first, isn't it? <laughs> because if we don't, uh, if, if our ethical behaviour is not so good, we don't usually feel good about ourselves. So. It's very, it's the first thing we have peace, then peace in the family or in our relationships, then we have peace in the society we live in, and then we can have peace in the world. So as I often say, if people, the whole world kept the five precepts, this is not possible, <laughs> then it would be like uh, paradise, it would be like heaven on earth. So how do we know uh, what is unwholesome and what's wholesome, what's positive and what's negative. Sometimes people say, you know, um, 
well, in a very relative terms, you know, and they look at the up, the uh, towards the end of the path where where, where a person has purified their ethical behaviour, so they're a very, very good person, and they let go, they don't hold on to their ethical behaviour, they don't hold on to the good or the bad, and, but that's at the upper end of the path. We, at the beginning of the path, we definitely need to hold on to our seal, that's for sure. And uh, so sometimes people think it's a very relative, good and bad is a relative thing, and it can be, but uh, the Buddha gave some very, very good guidelines for us, so I think these are um, good to keep in mind. And this is the advice he gave to his own son, Rahula, when he was seven years old, and evidently after he told must have told a lie, and so the Buddha gave him this teaching, fantastic teaching, really, it's really good. Um, so he he uh, mentions to his son that before he does an action of by body, speech, or mind while he's doing it and afterwards he should keep this in mind and he says these are the criteria he says does it harm does it cause harm to myself or to others or both uh, or not so he's looking at whether it's causing harm hurting us hurting others or both and then of course this is very similar to what i was talking about with the uh, the uh, the factors of the noble eightfold path where is it coming from? Is it coming from an unwholesome or a negative motivation or a wholesome or positive motivation? So this is good, isn't it? We can just see, is it hurting myself or others? And where am I coming from? And we can do that. I think people can do that. Whether they can do it before, during and after they take an action, that's another thing. And uh, of course, the, the other aspect of it is, what are the consequences of this action? Are they painful or pleasant? And, and the, if we see the, the consequences of it, if they're pleasant consequences, of course we, we can uh, continue with that action or repeat it again. But if, if it's painful consequence, then we can in future learn from it and not say that, not do that, or not think that way. You know, it's easy to say not think that way, but what we do is encourage different ways of thinking that bring more positive results. The other aspect that uh, I think is a very good, uh, very good way to um, judge what is good and what is bad is really to use ourselves as a measuring stick. You know, would I like someone to say or do what I'm about to say or do to another person? Would I like them to say that or do that to me? And if I reflect, no, I would not like to hear this, <laughs> I would not like to have someone do this, then I will, I, th I will pull up and say, no, I won't go that way. So that's very, very useful, because we usually know what we don't, we don't like, what we, we find, <laughs> ah, that's scary, what we, we find unpleasant uh, and uh, painful and hurtful. So if we extend that to others, use ourselves as a measuring stick, that's a very an easy way, I think, to um, look after our conduct. And also it's, it's quite interesting that human beings, regardless of whether they have a spiritual tradition or a religious background, usually have this sense of conscience, don't they? And this is a very important aspect in the Buddha's teaching too, and he calls it hiriotapa, and there's a Pali name for it. But it's really the sense of, of conscience and the awareness of the consequences or fear of the consequences that come from that. And the Buddha called this the guardian or protectors of the world. That sense of, we know, even, you know, people have a, a sense of right and wrong and they know thing, if, if something is not good. And there's a little story that uh, brings this home, I think, and I've told this before. You'll forgive me if you're... I don't tell it every week, so that's good. <laughs> and this concerns a teacher who was in uh, ancient India in Taxila, which was a, a, a center of learning and had universities and so on there. Um, and this teacher had a student, had many students, because he was a famous teacher, a good teacher. And uh, so one day he wanted to, he announced to his students that he, he would offer his uh, daughter's hand in marriage to one of his students. 
And what the requirement for the, the successful, successful student was that they had to go into the village and steal as much as they could and, uh, and uh, just take as much as they could. But, he said, one of the conditions was that nobody must see you stealing. Nobody must see you stealing. So his stu students went into the village and were stealing left, right and centre, at night presumably, and, uh, and amassing all, this, all these things that they'd stolen. So at the end of the period the, uh, for this, a week or something like that, the teacher gathered them together to see all, all their loot. <laughs> And uh, some of them had, had indeed stolen quite a lot, some had stolen less, and, and one had stolen nothing. And uh, he, the teacher turned to him and said, why, why haven't you stolen anything? Why haven't you, uh, uh, like the other students, you know, they've got lots of stuff they've stolen. And he said, ah, he said, I remembered your condition that nobody must see us when we steal. And he said, yes, yes, did anybody see you? And he said, yes. I did. <laughs> I did. So he said, I couldn't steal. And so that's why I didn't steal anything from the village. And of course, who, who was the one that got this daughter's hand in marriage? This one. <laughs> as natural. You know, you think, well, he's a good, he's very good ethics, actually. So, uh, so that's a very nice thing to remember. And it very much ties in with that idea of conscience. We see what we, what we do, what we say. And of course, we know what we think you often. So we're the ones that uh, can be aware uh, of, uh, have this sense of conscience about our actions and speech and see the consequences. So now I was just going to talk a little bit about the precepts themselves uh, and the other aspects of, of uh, the sila too, of ethical behaviour, which is right speech, you know, it covers right speech a bit, and also the ten courses of positive or wholesome action. So the Buddha, um, he gave many different sort of lists of precepts for, for people, for, for the lay people, the five precepts, and sometimes for special days, you know, the full moon days, they would keep the eight precepts, and these are an additional three to the usual five. Uh, well, actually, there's like four additional ones. One is not having any sexual activity that day. The second uh, one is not eating after after midday. The third one is not um, uh, dancing or singing, going to shows and wearing adornments. And the last one, not um, uh, relaxing or sleeping on high beds or seats. And these last three are just for restraining our sense of, you know, looking for comfort, looking for pleasure. But he often... Uh, taught the ten precepts for monks, novice monks, and then 227 precepts for the uh, um, the monks, myself included, for monks, and 311 for the for the nuns. This is the bhikkhunis; they get even more. <laughs> but the basic heart of all those is the five precepts. And many of these those rules for monks and nuns are not particularly moral things, you know, but they are very good for harmony in the sangha, in the, the community of monks or nuns. So the important thing with these five precepts particularly is that there is the two levels and uh, the insurance policy level is not to refrain from doing that, uh, breaking that precept, but the bonus, the bonus uh, aspect of it is if we do the positive, do positive things that are the, sort of the opposite. So refraining is the number one, but then if we develop the opposite, that's even better. So when the first precept, uh, refraining from uh, killing living beings, at that level, that's great. We're not making any negative karma. And this is very important. This is why it's part of our insurance policy. Because if we do kill living beings, particularly if you kill human beings, that's <laughs> pretty soon the karma will catch up with you, actually, or the police will. So, um, but the opposite, and this is what we can develop, is loving kindness or compassion for, for other beings. If we have that in mind, it's pretty hard to kill them, actually. Because if you have that kindness in mind, you know that all beings want to live. Even these ants, these... Uh, pesky uh, mosquitoes, they want to live. This is the essential part of all beings. Just as human beings, we want to live. So that is 
one aspect, that's the first precept, just to mention that. So not to kill living beings, that level is um, the basic level, the minimum level, as Ajahn Jagro used to call it. Um, but the positive level, um, which makes good karma too, even more good karma, is uh, developing loving kindness and compassion. But the benefit we get from that too is this is in our minds. So we're the ones with loving kindness and compassion in our minds. And this is a very pleasant uh, uh, mind state to have. And the second precept, because we had them in Pali, you didn't see the English translation, not take, refraining from taking what is not given. This is really from stealing, you know. And there, of course, there's many aspects to stealing. Uh, it can go from, um, uh, you know, <laughs> robbing people, that's pretty obvious, you know, to very subtle, subtle things that uh, you often hear people talk about their tax returns and things like that. It can take on very many shades of what, uh, of stealing, what is not given. And the opposite of that is generosity. You know, when we give, we're not trying to get. So this is, stealing of course is taking, trying to, is getting, and uh, the opposite is giving, giving to uh, others. And uh, I have uh, t two stories but I'll, I'll, that uh, are quite good for the, point out this one. And this is Nasruddin, uh, Nasruddin story, and this is, a, he's a Sufi teacher. I tell these, his stories because they're quite funny, but they have a good point, a good point. And one day, Nasruddin, uh, he was, a, as I mentioned, a Sufi teacher, was caught pouring his neighbor's uh, wheat into his jar of, uh, in the communal grain store. So they had a, like a, a store for the whole village. And he was caught, so they took him to court, and the magistrate said to him, uh, said, uh, asked him, you know, he, he, said, uh, he said to the magistrate, actually, Your Honour, I am a fool. I don't know their wheat from my wheat. And then the magistrate, who was intelligent, he said, in that case, uh, why didn't you pour your wheat into their jars? And Nazarene said, ah, but I know my wheat from their wheat. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Just makes a very good point. And the other one that uh, is a joke that uh, I saw on the internet, actually, it was a very good one too. A man wrote a letter to the uh, tax office saying, tax department here really, I have been unable to sleep knowing that, that I have cheated on my income tax. I don't know if many people would be like that actually. I have underestimated my taxable income and have enclosed a cheque for $150. That's not so much. If I still can't sleep, I'll send the rest. <laughs> it's quite good. Isn't it? So this is this is uh, stealing, stealing in all its various sh uh, shades. There's many shades to it, and it's something to to be aware of. Because you know we would not like our our property to be stolen. It's really um, if we feel that way, then of course, using ourselves as the measuring stick, we shouldn't do it to others because we know how much difficulty uh, and how hurtful it can be for us as well. And the next one, of course, is uh, refraining from sexual misconduct. And that's even a bigger area, isn't it, these days? It's sort of uh, almost number one on the news um, uh, nearly every day. Now it's been eclipsed by the coronavirus of course so that's <laughs> that's taken the front front page but the Buddha is very um, uh, clear about uh, sexual misconduct and he, I'll read out what he says because it gives a better idea of the whole of uh, what sexual misconduct means because when we use that word many years ago it used to just be Buddhists who used that word those words sorry sexual misconduct but now everyone's using it. But it's still a very woolly term, isn't it? It doesn't, you think, what, sexual misconduct? What, what exactly is that? And you can say it's just misconduct or bad conduct in relation to sexual uh, matters. But the Buddha said, having abandoned sexual misconduct, you abstain from sexual misconduct. You do not have sexual relations with those who are under, under the age of consent, with those who are unable to give consent. Uh, e.g., this is from Ajahn Brahm, being mentally disabled, who are not free to refuse consent, such as a student, to their teacher, 
Um, also, you think of people, uh, in a sense, with, who are married because they have, they really um, they're not free to give to give consent. Where such consent uh, conduct would be breaking a law, or even with one already engaged, so that's uh, sexual misconduct. So that's a very big area for people, and uh, if they see the um, consequences of that, you know, then they will steer away from it. They can see, first of all, that it's harming who? It's harming themselves. It's harming others, their relationships, uh, and harming both really. And the motivation behind it is usually a very um, impassioned, very uh, uh, momentary or passing uh, infatuation or um, uh, interest. And then, of course, the consequences are often incredibly bad. The fallout can be incredibly bad for, or for the person who has committed it, the person who has uh, been part of it, and and others to other relationships as well. So it's a it's a it's a very it's it's like a dynamite, isn't it? <laughs> this one's dynamite. So and then the uh, fourth precept is lying, isn't it? Lying. Uh, well, I should say the opposite. First of all, what's the opposite of uh, sexual misconduct? Because we can develop this, you know. And it's uh, contentment, you know, not not uh, seeking out uh, extra partners, looking for extra relationships, um, being reliable, dependable, these things. Um, valuing loyalty. Loyalty is a big aspect. We love loyalty. And you see all the videos on animals, dogs especially, and the loyalty you see in, uh, in animals is just sometimes incredible, especially these dogs. And... Um, so this is something that we we actually many people like a lot. But this part of loyalty, of course, is to our relationships too, and it's a part of honesty too, isn't it? Usually, it's a mixture of uh, of precepts we're breaking because the next one, of course, is lying. So often, when there's sexual misconduct involved, they'll be lying to other people and possibly lying to ourselves. That's possible. So the next one, of course, is lying. And that's uh, something that we're all familiar with. And, uh, you know, in, in our society, of course, it's something that comes up quite often in various uh, uh, shades. We have white lies, of course. And I know there's the story I heard, I think it was here, that uh, um, uh, somebody was at home and they said to their child, if anybody rings, tell them I'm not at home. And so when somebody rang... He, picked up the phone and he, he said, hello, hello. Oh, mummy said, there's nobody at home. She's not at home. <laughs> and uh, this, this is where lying begins, isn't it? We, we teach our children to do that and we think that's okay. So we're, we're very much used to, to lying in, some, in many respects. And of course, you know, we could say is advertising, you know, advertising is often misleading it can be misleading i like with advertising you always see at the bottom conditions apply it's very small writing but if you see the conditions then that that puts it all into perspective so so we abstain from lying we're truthful and uh, we we develop truth and this is an important quality because if we if we're seeking truth if we're developing a spiritual path that's looking for truth then if we're lying, this is absolutely the opposite direction, isn't it, to what we are looking for. And there's a, a nice uh, Nasrudin story too, that uh, it's a bit unusual, this one, see how you like it, that um, Nasrudin, uh, his neighbour came over and he wanted to borrow his donkey. Nasrudin always has a donkey and uh, his donkey is very important to him, just like our cars are these days. And uh, Nasruddin said to the neighbour, he'd already lent the donkeys, and, you know, somebody's borrowed it already. And then the donkey brayed, it made the sound. <laughs> and the neighbour said, but, but Nasruddin, I just heard your donkey. And Nasruddin replied to him, he said, who do you believe, a donkey or me? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's very, very bold. Who do you believe, a donkey or me? 
So, and I last, uh, last time I dealt with the right speech, so I also mentioned the other types of right speech, uh, the other types that uh, we have to take into consideration for ethical behaviour, and that's divisive speech. So we're not speaking to divide people from each other. That's a very important one. Not talking behind people's backs in order to, uh, to divide those people put, uh, or make one of the parties close to oneself, you know. That's, uh, so this is the opposite of that, is to bring people together, you know, to, to unite them, uh, to help resolve any problems, any difficulties, and not to create them. And the other one, the other part of that is harsh speech. So, uh, as I mentioned, that can be abusive sweet speech, that can be swearing, that can be many insulting speech, all those sorts of things. And... Uh, the opposite of that, it's very good for us to develop, is that gentle speech, calm speech, you know, that, uh, that uh, is pleasant for people to hear um, and pleasant for us to say. Um, so that's another aspect of speech. And then idle gossip is another one that the Buddha mentions uh, that we uh, should avoid. We should avoid at all costs because gossip is... <laughs> Half, half the news, I think, there's a lot of the news is about gossip. We see particularly, uh, you know, whether it be the royal family or the fil film stars, whether it be um, about sports stars, these, these people, or singers, actors, all these people, politicians. And um, so because we see, sometimes people think, well, what's the problem with gossip? Of course, gossip can be incredibly destructive and it may not even be true what the gossip that's gone around. So it can be very, very destructive. And so the fifth precept, of course, alcohol and drugs. And this is very obvious, the, uh, it's more, becoming more and more obvious, the damage that does for our society. And we hear of this, the ice epidemic and this epidemic and that epidemic, well, corona, 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 coronavirus de uh, epidemic. But this, is, this causes a lot of difficulty in our society. We see it, you know, it's one of the roots, isn't it, of domestic violence and, and so on at home. It enables many, many things to happen. Just recently, uh, I heard about uh, a girl who was hit by a car on the, uh, when she was on a, on, a, a crossing, on a crossing and was killed. And they suspect the, the driver was on drugs or alcohol at that time. So uh, it's, it's very possible, and I remember a few years ago someone uh, killing five people, I think, <laughs> on Dandenong Road that was on ice. So it's terrible, the re results of these uh, alcohol and drugs can be. And the last three I'm just going to mention because they're important because we often t talk about ethics in terms of what we do and what we say, but also there's an aspect of what, how we think too. And the Buddha mentions this in the tw 10 courses of wholesome or good action that lead to good results. And the first one was to have a mind that's not jealous of other people's uh, possessions or their relationships, whatever it be. This is often called covetousness in, in, in old English, but it's this sort of jealousy. And instead to have happiness or joy for another person's good fortune. This is mudita, this is very, very good. And a mind that's eaten up with this sort of jealousy with other, what others have is not a very positive mind. And of course, the Buddha is saying it will take us to a very bad place, a very bad rebirth actually, not good for the insurance policy. And he said uh, non-ill will is, is a very a positive thing. So to develop positive mind states, uh, that like loving kindness and compassion that I mentioned before. And he said not to have wrong views, very important. So if we have very uh, wrong views that say, for instance, say there is no problem with killing other people, uh, no problem with... Um, lying, sexual misconduct, stealing, and with uh, um, taking alcohol and drugs, the consequences of that <laughs> will lead to a lot of problems for that person. I say to people, if you want to have an interesting life, break the five precepts. And I remember one of my teachers, Ajahn Jagra, he said, they will never, never, never make a teledrama about somebody keeping five precepts. 
because <laughs> the teledramas are all about people, usually about sexual misconduct, actually, but also lying, stealing, and a bit of killing in there as well, and uh, lots of alcohol and drugs. Uh, but I think, so these are the, it's really taking 10, if you've counted those, that's 10. It's extending the, uh, the uh, right action of not uh, destroying or taking, killing uh, living beings, not taking what's not given, stealing, and not sexual misconduct. It's added the, uh, the not lying and uh, not divisive speech, uh, not um, a divisive speech and not harsh speech, not gossip, uh, and not taking alcohol and drugs. And then these other three, this non-jealousy or happiness for others' good fortune, non-ill will, positive mind states and right views. So that's like 10, that's a really comprehensive uh, view of our ethical behaviour. So, first of all, then, then the important thing to reflect is what do I get out of it? <laughs> that's what most people want to know. What's the benefit of keeping it? And of course, as, the, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, you know, this is a gift we give to ourselves because somebody that keeps, um, you know, good uh, ethical behaviour, they feel good about themselves. They don't feel, um, you know, they have quite good self-esteem. They'll have good self-esteem and they will feel confident where they go and they know they're doing their best. And so it's particularly by body speech but also by mind. So this is one of the benefits, first of all, is that we, we experience a sort of ease with ourselves. We can be comfortable with ourselves because we know what we're doing and saying is not hurting or harming ourselves, but not hurting or harming others as well. So that's, that's a wonderful thing because many people, what, what eats at their minds is what they've done and said, isn't it? We all have, we have that come up, you know, think, oh, oh, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that. And so this is a very important aspect of it. And of course, from the Buddha's perspective too, it is protecting us. It's the insurance policy for, for this life. Because as I say, if, if you want to get into hot water, you can break any of these. And it will certainly make your life very uh, exciting and uh, probably very unpleasant <laughs> as well. So, so we can see that it protects us from that. And I know uh, one time the... Uh, uh, there's a, some Thai monks came to Ajahn Brahm's monastery and one of them uh, was talking about uh, how uh, they went for a, a dana actually, they went for a meal at somebody's house and there was a tank with, an aquarium tank with fish in it and some of the monks were saying, oh it's terrible isn't it, keeping these poor fish, they're not out in nature and all this sort of thing, you know, it's, uh, they're, uh, you know, cooped up in this tank and the other one of the monks I think the senior monk was saying no 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 they're protected because you know they get food and the water temperature is controlled and if they clean the food clean the tank that's a clean environment and you know they're, they're secure and the and the other monks ah oh, yes and and then he said just in the same way you know these five precepts protect us they protect us they keep us um, safe so this is a very a very important part, just like the fish in the aquarium, you know, these five, five precepts, they create um, boundaries, yes, but the boundaries that are very useful for us, very supportive for us, and others, and others. And also, one of the things that it, it works against is, um, it works against the negative emotions that we often have, it helps us purify them, because there's often this idea that particularly with anger, or um, particularly anger, yes, that we should get it off our chest. You know, you have to say it, we have to express it, and uh, that way it reduces the anger. But from a Buddhist perspective, and I think most people who reflect on their situation, they realize that if they get angry, yes, I do feel much better for a few minutes, then, then I may regret it, you know, I may regret it, but it also becomes much, much easier to do again and again. So it, it's creating a, a rut in the mind. This is what Ayakima often said, German, famous German nun. She says, like a vehicle going over a piece of ground, it gets deeper and deeper uh, ruts and eventually it can become even stuck or bogged. And you can see that. These are creating habits in our minds. And this is the important thing 
from the Buddhist perspective, to realize our minds, our actions, our speech come from these habits, this conditioning. Not only from, um, you know, we think it's coming from ourselves, it's coming from our society, our teachers, our parents, it's coming from our friends, it's coming from many different sources. So we want to um, not develop these negative qualities. And one of the most dangerous uh, forms of anger is righteous anger. People heard of righteous anger? I'm right, I'm right. There's, and, uh, you know, they're definitely wrong. In some cases that may be true. It may be true. But in the Buddha's teaching, there's no justification for anger at all. And he has the very extreme simile or image that if somebody, if bandits were cutting off our limbs, arms, legs, with a two-handled saw, 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 these are very big saws with a person at each end, uh, probably today we'd say with a chainsaw, if they were doing that and we were to have a mind of ill will, we, we would not be practicing his teaching. Could you do that? Could I do that? <laughs> I wonder. But I think it's an extreme example just to let us know there is no justification for even if we are right, and as Ajahn Chah has famously said, something can be right but not good. So our, some, we can be right and then our action or reaction can be not good, coming from a negative place. So this is one of the uh, important things. And I know Ayakima also, she often taught to these things, what people say, what they do, that we get excited about, <laughs> uh, are just really triggers. Because if this emotion weren't in us, this anger, this irritation, um, this negative emotion weren't in us, it would be not possible. And she used to say, don't blame the trigger, don't blame the trigger. That's pretty hard to do, actually, when somebody is telling you something you don't want to hear or doing something you don't want to see or experience. So this, uh, these precepts help us purify the mind because we're refraining, we're restraining ourselves from doing and saying things. But it's important to realise that we, we need, for instance, mindfulness to remember the precepts. If we, we don't remember them, then it's very easy to break them, actually because we don't have them in mind. And when we keep them in mind, then when we get close to a situation where the, we may break them, it'll come up, uh, more, more likely to come up. And we'll see what the situation is. We'll see then where we're coming from, probably. Um, we'll see also, maybe even see that this is harmful. And uh, we can see the feelings and the, the bodily uh, uh, sensations as well. And then we can choose not to speak or act, to refrain. And this is something that is, uh, is a real uh, strength if people can say no <laughs> to things uh, that, uh, like anger, for instance, but even to greed. You know, if, uh, if we see something we really like and we think we've got to have it, to be able to say, no, I don't have to have it. Um, is, is really the way or a, a way to freedom. We get some freedom, we get some strength and can feel a lot happier that we were able to say no. And this is called building up what I call the muscle of restraint or refrain, refraining. That ability to say no is really amazingly uh, powerful. So I often mention, I mentioned before the Chadston experiment where you go into Chadston one side and walk through Chadston and not buy anything. So to see if, if in fact you can do it, you can say no to all those tempting things, you know, the, the items that are on sale that are so, so much cheaper than usual and the right colour or whatever it is. And one of the Nice sayings I often mention, and this is in relation to anger, but can be in relation to greed um, as well, is where Bhante G, Bhante Gunaratana said, simply refuse to let your anger tell you what to say. Isn't that good? That's really a nice way of putting it, so that we're not manipulated by these negative states of mind, not controlled by them. And this can be, you know, if we can do that, it gives us choice. It gives us the possibility to do something else, to come off the automatic programming that we have, you know, which may be to immediately retaliate and, and say something nasty back to the other person. And also this asila, what we get out of it is too, is taking 
responsibility for our actions is very, um, it's a very important aspect of it. And that we, we see, we don't blame others so much and we can look at our own behaviour, look at our own mind. And Ajahn Chah said we should look at ourselves 95% of the time and others 5% of the time. And he had a nice simile for this, actually, which is, he said sometimes there'd be a big hole and he said uh, um, a person would put his whole arm in the, the hole and he couldn't reach the bottom. He said, the hole's too deep, the hole's too deep. And Ajahn Chah said, they never think, my arm's too short. Because <laughs> we always think of the other person, you know, the blame there, it's their fault, you know, for, for whatever. So I'd better finish off, just mention that uh, to the Buddha encouraged us to think about our sila, the ethical conduct, and he had a whole uh, recollection or contemplation of our conduct of uh, body and speech particularly to, to reflect on and give happiness to ourselves that we are, you know, doing, uh, we are um, keeping this ethical behaviour. We have got good uh, ethical behaviour. And it can be very useful for the meditation. And this is why he actually encourages it as a basis for developing the meditation. And uh, I will probably, I don't know, I've got two more things. So, and the meditation uh, needs, the Buddha always said, needs the support of ethical behaviour. And he said, and this is a quote from the Buddha, I don't know whose translation actually, uh, stillness or samadhi when imbued with ethical behaviour brings great fruit and profit. So that's uh, meditation, the states of mind when the minds coming together are supported by ethical behaviour. And it makes perfect sense because if we're thinking about, worrying about what we've done and said, how can the mind come together? It'll just be distracted with these negative thinking thoughts of regret, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that. And then he continues, and, and he says, wisdom when imbued with stillness or samadhi, the mind coming together, brings great fruit and profit. And the third thing, the mind imbued with or having wisdom becomes completely free from the corruptions, these are the negative qualities, that is, from the corruption of sensuality, of being, of views, and of ignorance. So this is the path to liberation, he's, the Buddha is saying. So the ethical conduct, that gives rise to good meditation. Good meditation gives rise to the wisdom that can free us. But I'd like to just mention too, especially because it, the, of the bushfires, that um, there's also often times when people are experiencing difficulties in their lives, or we had recently the bushfires, people do what uh, in Pali is called sacha kiriya, sacha kiriya. In Sinhala they saw it, call it sacha, sacha uh, kriya, sacha kriya. And this is like an affirmation of truth, but it's really an affirmation of truth, the power of goodness really of body, uh, speech and mind. And it usually focuses on by the power of this truth, something that I've done, uh, something that uh, something very good that I've done, may this uh, whatever the situation be avoided or may it uh, situation improve. So, for the recent bushfires, I know there were three at least of these uh, um, satya kriyas, uh, this wishing, this uh, uh, doing good things, and then bringing to mind the the rain coming and putting the fire out, that sort of thing. They did it three times and maybe it had an effect. They did seem to have a bit more rain than expected. So so this is the power of goodness too. And it is a power actually, it is a power, it protects us. So this is, and we, as I say, we feel good and it's a gift we give to others. So I'd like to, and yes, yes, there's more one could say. <laughs> But I'd like to finish there just to encourage all of us to, um, to give this gift to ourselves and to others, uh, to give this gift that gives rise to, um, as a contribution to world peace, peace in our minds and peace in our society, peace in the world. And also to protect to ourselves, you know, 
in this life to bring happiness and well-being in this life and in future lives. So that when we move from this life, when we have our send-off from this life, we have a suitcase full of good things uh, that we will take with us, not the rubbish. We can leave the rubbish behind. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. I hope that was useful and that's the... Um, today was the Sama Kamanta, the right action. So I hope that was of use. Thank you. There we are. Sadhu. And are there any questions, comments, or complaints? Hi, Chang, I have a question. Oh, all right. Good, good. It's not, in, it's not online. Oh, not um, online. Oh, yeah. it's online. You, we have, from we you, have an fresh. online one as well. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about intention? Because quite often we may have the best of intentions and the actions go out and they turn out to be completely pear go out completely pear-shaped. Yes. But as I see it, um, at the moment anyway, is that it's the, it's the intention that leaves the impression on the mind and that's, it's the impression on the mind is what we take into our, into our next life. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it, yes. So, so if we are coming from a negative intention, you know, an unwholesome state of mind, which is either greed, hatred or delusion, any of these, well, any of these negative ones, getting, as I mentioned, uh, or harming and uh, also ill will, if we're coming from any of those intentions, then the result will be negative impression, neg negative karma, as you mentioned. So... The Buddha said, actually, that uh, uh, karma is intention, or intention, I say, is karma. So th this is the very important thing. And as you mentioned, Sri Truth, you cannot, we cannot predict how people will take what we do and say, but we can, if we're coming from a very good place, we are not making any negative karma, uh, certainly not. And uh, we may after their reaction... Um, so what we we can take care of is just our intention, uh, you know, in doing and saying something from a good heart. How people take that, of course, will be their business and they will be making karma uh, when they respond, if they respond negatively. And then we can make karma from what they say, actually, if we react negatively ourselves. So, you, it's, you know, you, you can, as they say, lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, you know. So we cannot predict, we cannot say that others should, you know, if we say something good, we say something, uh, we do something good and they don't react in a similar fashion, um, then we just have to let that be. We, we realise that uh, that's, they're making uh, bad karma. And in a sense, if we don't get involved in it, they don't make any more than they have or have initially made so that's a good point I think a very good point but as I say then then we need not worry too much about the outcomes for things you know you know if one of the defilements of giving is expecting other people to be appreciative isn't it if we give with a whole heart and then we get so disappointed because the other person doesn't like it doesn't want it that's that's their, it's their thing, not, we could say their problem, but it's uh, not something that we should allow to, you know, to uh, reduce the, uh, the intention that we had, the good intention we had. So that's very, very important, yeah. So we can't dictate to the world how it responds. <laughs> but we can look after where we're coming from. That's the good news. And that's always possible. That's always possible, even in difficult situations. So thank you for that, Sri Juth. Yes. Any other comments, comments, questions, or complaints? Thank you for the talk, Ajahn. Oh, fine, fine, Andrew. Yes. Now, um, very inspiring and truthful words, um, but we now have to go and we might have to face difficult situations in our day to day life. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you have some advice about, say, we have to deal with it. We know that there's going to be a person we have to deal with, mm -hmm. and they might even be unjust. Um, they might even um, be abusive or something. Mm -hmm. And so just some advice about maintaining this principle of right speech and right action, mm -hmm. whereby we can stand up for ourselves in the sense we mm -hmm. won't let someone exploit or abuse us or whatever, mm -hmm. but without anger. Just some advice about that, because these situations mm -hmm. can arise. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes, I think it's very, very true. And uh, again, you know, it's really the, the main way, I think, isn't it, is, is looking after our intention, 
where we're coming from and particularly having a mind state that is kind to ourselves and uh, uh, that is important because if we go into any situation with a negative mind state, for instance fear or something like that, then other people uh, can pick up on that to a certain extent and then may be abusive, may be exploitive, uh, you know, hurtful. So I think this would be um, what we can do from that side, you know, is to, as much as possible, you know, to come from a good place and then when we, um, when somebody uh, is, is, is speaking in a particular, in a negative way, to deal with, in the, from coming from a good place. Maybe we have to be uh, somewhat assertive, you know, you know but uh, not to get caught up in the anger. It's very difficult sometimes, it can be very difficult because people are pressing our buttons <laughs> and we tend to react. But we won't always be successful. But if we have the intention, you know, to look after our speech, look after where we're coming from, because after all, where we're coming from is home. That's where we live, inside. So this is the important thing. So if we're coming from a good place and we try our best with our speech, not to be hurtful, harmful with it, uh, to be as kind as possible, and stick to, you know, one way of dealing with people like that can be just to stick to the facts, you know, try and keep it clear. It's often hard to keep a clear mind and just state what the facts are rather than investing it with any emotional point of view, you know, or, or from a sense of hurt, which can often arise when, when somebody is abusing us or, you know, uh, those sorts of things. So I think that it's not easy. It's part of the practice. And that's why it is a practice, because we won't be perfect, you know, and we do our best. But to have the intention to practice is very important, you know. Many people haven't got that intention. And if we don't have the five precepts or these ethical standards, we, we don't have anything to measure up to or to use as our gauge, you know, and are useful. But we shouldn't, for instance, you know, um, give ourselves a hard time if, we don't, <laughs> if we're not perfect, because we won't be perfect. That's for sure. So it's, they are for, they're called training rules. They're not called, you know, uh, um, commandments or thing, anything like that. They're training rules. We're training. And uh, we're all in training until we become fully enlightened. That's quite, that's quite a ways. So we do our best on the way. And be kind to ourselves too. Good. So, yes, next question. Thank you for your talk. I've yeah. enjoyed yeah. it quite a lot. Good. Um, the question I had was about um, you're talking about the 207 precepts that the mm -hmm. the monks um, have to follow mm -hmm. and how they help to keep harmony in the monastery. Mm -hmm. So I don't know any of those 207 precepts, and I was curious if you could elaborate a bit on oh. they, how they maintain harmony. Yes, right. Yes, there's a, there's a lot of them are very practical things, you know, about. Uh, using, you know, insulting language and uh, hitting, you know, uh, hitting another monk and things like that. Um, any, you know, there are lots of situations that, uh, and when you see the rules, actually, you, you, you realise that the Buddha's time and our time is not so different, really. And, uh, and the Buddha was around, and yet some of these situations occurred. But, you know, abusive uh, language, uh, being difficult with the, uh, in, the, uh, in the community of monks to being difficult to um, advise or, you know, uh, um, give guidance to. Some of, the, some of the monks were really difficult. And, um, you know, there's many, many things like that. There are ordinary things like, uh, you know, funny things like not tickling. <laughs> because, <laughs> because one time, the, the, probably the, the small monks, you know, the novice monks, they're often under 20, were playing and one of them got tickled and he died. He died. He had a, a, probably a heart attack, I guess, I don't know, couldn't breathe, and he died. So that, the Buddha made that a rule, you know, not to, to, to uh, we shouldn't tickle other monks. <laughs> so those, you know, there are many of them very practical things, very ordinary things, so not very moral things, you know, unless you're intending to kill that person by tickling them to death. <laughs> that would be, you know, that would be immoral, that's for sure. So those t 227 precepts, they cover a whole range. Some of them, you know, about splitting the sangha, sitting, splitting the community of monks, because sometimes there are differences of opinions about things. 
And um, this is a very serious thing to do, you know, split the community. And so there's a lot of rules about that too. So they're all aimed at, uh, at, at bringing uh, unity and uh, bringing uh, harmony to the Sangha. Yeah, so. And they are training rules too. They're not, as I say, many of them not very moral sorts of things, of course. There are, but uh, those ones are mainly for unity and harmony. So I think, I hope that answers you. If you look at the, the uh, we call it the vinya, the rules for the monks and nuns, it's really interesting. I mean, you, you read, uh, read uh, what was happening at the time of the Buddha and you, it, 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 it makes you, because sometimes we have a very precious view of the Buddha, you know, a very idealized view of the Buddha. But you see, he dealt with very everyday, gritty sort of day-to-day -day stuff. And he did in a very clear way, in a very, uh, you know, very uh, uh, wise way, you know. So, so we have those rules, and uh, mm, that's good. That's very interesting. So, so I think that's it. Oh, all right. Yes. From where? Oh, USA. All right. Uh. Sorry. The question from USA. How much do you think right action and right view? depends on a person's culture, beliefs and conditioning. What is the best way to do the self-discovery for right and wrong? Ah, uh -huh. all right, all right, all right. Yes, right. self-discovery for right and wrong. Well, I think, uh, yes, um, right view, it doesn't really depend on culture or time, I don't think. Though, you know, here, you know, in the West, for instance, there's, um, many people don't believe in karma and rebirth, for instance, which is, which is part of right view, and it has its consequences because of that. You know, so um, the the Buddha's teaching really is actually timeless. I mean, that's what we call. That's what we chant. Is one of the qualities of the Dhamma is that. Uh, it's uh, sand, uh, it's timeless, it's kaliko, but it's uh, it, it can be seen here and now. It can be seen in the present. Um, but so that quality is coming from an enlightened mind. You know, that's what we have the faith in the Buddha that he he was talking about right view, not as a theory, not as a good idea, but from his experience of uh, reality. So that that is a, like a um, you know. Uh, is something that is is rare. It's somebody who's stepped outside the human condition and can see it so well. So I would say that it's not so much affected by uh, culture and time, though you know culture and time may look at what the Buddha taught in different ways. That's that's for sure, and you see that in the West, especially at the moment with in the karma and rebirth. And uh, how do we know what's right and wrong? Exactly that very, very pragmatic, very practical way that the Buddha gave, advice he gave to his son. We see if something is harmful to ourselves or to others or both. Uh, by seeing that, we can tell whether it's something that's good. And also, um, we see that where we're coming from, you know, if we're coming from a positive place or we're coming from a defilement like of uh, jealousy, anger, uh, greed, any of these negative ones. So we see where we're coming from and then we see the consequences because it's very practical. You see, well I did this and I said that and this happened. That was an unpleasant consequence and, uh, um, uh, or a pleasant consequence. I know Sriju <laughs> just mentioned that you can say something to somebody and then the consequence can be negative, you know, their reaction. But we have to look at it from our own point of view, you know, uh, how we feel in ourselves, you know. Do we feel like, yeah, we came from a good place and uh, so that that's the sort of consequence that I would see in a personal level, that we feel like we've acted in a, uh, um, a, a good manner, wholesome manner, you know, in a, a manner that's got integrity because then we can feel okay about it, you know, regardless of how the person takes it. Mm. So I hope that gives you some idea of how to look at what's uh, um, good and, and bad. That's how the Buddha was ta talking about it. In terms, very practical, you know, everyday um, way that we speak and the way we act, you know, so it's, I think, very useful. Does that cover it all, the Langdon? Is that? I so, suppose so. so. Yeah, I hope, I hope that was okay for those in, in the US.
There we are. So I think now we we had best finish off because you're all invited to the lunch next door, the shared lunch next door, um, and so uh, we can those who'd like to, we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and, uh, and then we can finish off.